Hi, it's Miss Lisa from the St. Paris Public Library. Welcome back to night number two of the chapter book reading of A Feather. Let's get started. Chapter six, Rufus. Cold, so cold and wet, so wet. I discovered why this hole was empty. It's built wrong. It's tipped towards the sky a little and it lets all the rain in. All the smart owls figured out this fact. Only the worst owl in history of owldom would miss such a crucial fact, would discover this only because the skies opened and poured waterfalls from the clouds, and they poured right in on my head. My wings are bedraggled, my horn feathers are slick against my skull, my chest feathers are matted. Everything is terrible. All night I waited for the rain to stop so my feathers would dry. The rain did not stop, so now I'm half sleeping on the edge of this soggy tree hole with my wings stretched a little, letting the sun dry me out, hoping no one notices me, especially something humiliating like a thrush. How awful would it be to get attacked by a tiny nothing bird like a thrush? A rumbling comes from somewhere nearby and then dies, the same kind of rumbling that the monsters make. I crack open my eyes and peer around my hole. Nothing. I'm safe for now. There's rush, rustling in the grass, some cries of birds and grunts of deer and buzzing of bugs. Nothing too close. I doze in and out of the world, checking it every so often for danger. When the warmth reaches all the way to my gizzard, I test my wing. It feels not great, but not terrible. It might fly. I stretch it out, give it a full flap. The pain is sharp, but I can fly with it. I have to be able to fly with it. I open my eyes and the light is blinding. How do animals live in such brilliance? The world is white and sparkly and sharp. Then I hear it squeaking, not far from here, serious squeaking. I swivel my head and see the mouse. It's just sitting in the grass, running in circles, squeaking. Is this mouse crazy? Why squawk so the whole forest while spinning around in one place? There might be a hungry owl nearby. There is a hungry owl nearby, a starving owl. I'm off the tree before I think to check my feathers. They're still full of water and I kind of half glide, half plummet to the grass near the mouse. It seems to be trapped inside a spider's web. I hop into the web, but it's stiff like a twig. I can't get my claws on the little ball of fur. I grab again. The mouse shrieks and skitters around inside the web. Oh, be quiet, I hoot, grabbing and poking with my talons. What is this web made of that I can't get this delicious, tasty trap just beneath my feet, mouse? And then I feel something slip through the feathers all along one of my toes. A slick filament slides up my skin and then grabs. This is a very strange web. Perhaps this mouse is more trouble than it's worth. I go to lift my leg, but I but it's caught. My heart pounds. I jerk my foot again, still caught. Ah, I squawk. The web has me. The web has me. The mouse squeals angrily like maybe it has a clutch of family that's on its way. I flap and lift off the ground with the shrieking mouse and its web of terror strikes strings, but it's too heavy and my wings scream with pain and I flop down into the grass. Could the mouse have built this web to trap owls? Could the prey have found a way to fight back? Great beak, what is it going to, what is going on in this forest of rumbling monsters and vengeful mice? Help, I cry. The prey are on the attack. Help! Hearing my own squawks, I wonder what owl would even bother to help. How big a failure of a raptor do you have to be to get caught by a mouse in a spider web? Imagine if first saw me like this, or father, even mother. I will not go down without a fight. Even the worst great horned owl is still a great horned owl, as father reminded me once. I will do you proud, I squawked. I give my leg one last jerk, confirm I've been captured, and flop still, awaiting the throng of angry vermin that must be on its way, my talons sharp and ready. Chapter 7. Reenie. 
It's not a hawk, Beatrice yells as we run from where we've hidden in the tall grass. It looks like a hawk. It's definitely not a hawk. Our trap has worked, but also failed. The state only lets a falconer trap a passage red-tailed hawk or gosh hawk. If it's anything else, we have to let it go and then reset the whole trap. So I'm kind of angry at whatever this thing is that's broken my bow charty trap. I worked all week to get perfect for my passage hawk. That is until I see that it's the most fantastically amazing, beautiful bird I've ever seen in my whole life. It's the size of a giant watermelon, but brown, with its huge wings open and stretched out along the ground like it's trying to fly. As we approach, its head, its head rotates almost all the way around, and I see two enormous yellow eyes rimmed in black, surrounded by disk of coppery feathers. The eyes are on fire, daring me to come any closer. The deep V of the black-brown feathers that stretches from its foreheads towards its hooked beak forms a scowl. It screeches, and two feathery horn, horns flip up off its head, adding wings to the V, as if saying, Are you looking at me? It's the ultimate dragon bird, the kind of all birds, or the king of all birds. It's a great horned owl, Beatrice says, stopping near where it lies in the grass. It flaps its splaying wings, then arranges them in this weird upside-down way, fanning out the feathers around its head and body like a wide ruff. It looks like a miniature turkey, all puffed up and angry. The owl stumbles away from us, dragging the trap with it. It gets about five inches before it flops still again. It's awful to see this big king dragged through the dirt by my trap. I kneel beside him and he turns his spectacular face to me. Glowing eyes lock onto my heart. We have to free him, I say, knowing it to be true. That no matter how much I want to keep him, this bird is meant to be wild. Him? Beatrice kneels beside me, examining the owl. Yes, him, I say. He snaps his beak, making this clacking sound and flops around trying to get to his feet. Beatrice gently places a blanket over him, folding his wings against his back and holding him steady as she works his talons free from the trap. Look, she says, holding his legs in her thick leather gloves. I peer at his glorious little face, which looks like the most malevolent stuffies curled in the blanket. He's not even scratching at me, she says. A ribbon of cold runs through me. Dragon birds fight to survive. Why isn't he fighting? What does that mean? He might be sick or hurt, she says. Was it the trap? My voice gets stuck in my throat. I did this. I hurt him. Beatrice examines him a bit closer. No, she says. Look at his wing. This bird can't go free today. His left wing sags away from his body, and I can see some feathers that are matted with blood. He's hurt, I ask. The ribbon of cold turns into a knot around my gut. He's also dehydrated, Beatrice says, and probably starving. The knot tightens with each pronouncement. Can you help him, I ask? Please don't say he's going to die. Beatrice sighs. We can try, but that's the end of our passage hawk quest for the weekend. That's okay, I say. He needs our help. He starts panting and hissing and snapping his little beak, still fighting my dragon bird. Beatrice smiles down at him. Yes, he does. I carry the trap and she carries the owl back to the truck. I put the trap in the bed and hop into my seat. I am completely shocked when I see Beatrice hold out the owl in his blanket to me. I can hold him, I asked, afraid to put my hopes into words. How else am I going to drive to the hospital? Shouldn't we tape him or something? We have painter's tape and a length of pantyhose I can I call the sleeve, which we were going to secure our passage hawk in when, if we caught one. I'm not sure he'd last through the taping. She places the precious package into my arms, then flips over the extra material to cover his head. This will help keep him calm. What about the hood? Falconers put these cute little leather cat hats called hoods on falcons' heads to keep them calm when traveling. We have a couple of different size hoods, and we were going to use one on, this, on the passage hawk. I don't have a hood big enough for that melon. Beatrice says, shaking her head as she starts the engine. She calls someone on her phone. Hi, Lil. I have a sick owl with an injured wing. Pause. I guess that 
Lil is Lillian Cho, the vet Beatrice works for. Great, thank you. She hits the gas and travel and gravel goes flying as we head for the animal hospital. The blanket is thick, fleece lined on one side and tough canvas on the other, meant to withstand the slash of a talon. The owl is quiet, probably terrified out of his little mind. The truck bucks over ruts and rocks in the dirt road, and I use my legs to brace my body against the seat cushion to keep the worst of it from disturbing him. With each bounce, I scowl at the dashboard, willing the truck to keep still. I'm afraid to breathe too deeply for fear of startling him. He seems like a ghost inside the blanket. He's so light. It's the most shocking thing about these dragon birds. They're all feathers. How can someone so fierce also be so fragile? We arrive at the animal hospital where Beatrice works. She takes the owl from me and carries him in the back entrance. I follow her into one of the rooms where Dr. Cho waits in her white coat. Let's take a look at him, she says, placing the owl on an examining table. She removes the blanket and quickly places a smaller towel over the owl's head. She checks his back, then extends each wing while holding his body still. Dr. Cho then folds the wing in and turns him over. She blows on his spotted chest feathers. Why are you doing that, I ask. To see his skin, she says. If it's scaly, Beatrice says, returning after having changed into a set of scrubs, he's dehydrated. Which he is, Dr. Cho says. Well, you diagnosed it as far as I can tell. He hurt his wing. It looks like a puncture from a talon. He may have fallen out of his nest while branching and been attacked by another bird of prey, though he's a bit old for that. Branching is when a baby bird moves from the nest to hopping around on the branches of the tree the nest is in. It's the bird's equivalent of crawling. He's had the wound for a day or so, but he hasn't eaten or had a good drink in, a long, in longer than that. She touches what would be his breastbone if he were a human. His muscle tone is poor. But we can save him, right? I asked, practically falling off my bench listening to the diagnosis. Dr. Cho smiles as she places the owl back on his feet. We can try, she says. I do not like her lack of commitment. The doctor's stuff starts. Dr. Cho pulls out the syringe with a long length of tube off the end of it instead of a needle. She shoves the tube down the owl's throat. Hydration, she tells me. I cringe, digging my fingers into the underside of the bench. She finally pulls the tube out, then begins working on the wing. While she cleans the owl's wounds, Beatrice retrieves from the back a large dog crate with solid plastic walls. Once satisfied with her work, Dr. Cho puts the owl into the crate. My owl shuffles and flaps to the back of the crate, then huddles against the back wall, big eyes glaring at us. Now it's up to him, Dr. Cho says. We all look at the lump of feathers with the enormous eyes, and he scowls back at us. Fight, I tell him, as if our eyes can communicate. You fight, and I'll fight with you. We take him home, and Beatrice leads me to the dining room. I see now why she keeps it closed off. The room is, bare, is mostly bare, and the windows are shuttered, so it's dim as evening, even though it's midday. There's a, ter there's a table on one end and a smallish stained couch on the other. Its upholstery looks like it's been hit by a cheese shredder. In the center of the room is a perch. This is my training room, she explains, lowering the crate to the floor near a wall. If there's too much stuff in it, the hawk gets nervous. Some, some same about exposure to the outside or light. We should feed him, I say, kneeling in front of the crate. My owl is still hunched at the back. A petrified owl statue with great golden eyes. Maybe some lunch will help him feel less afraid. Some lunch will help me, Beatrice says, and walks out of the room. I drop to my knees and then stretch my legs back so I'm on my stomach in front of the cage. I rest my face on the backs of my hands. It's just me and the owl. Rufus. The name just comes to me. The owl has looked away, his head rotating to inspect the walls of the crate. Did he just tell me his name? No, of course not. That's insane. But I like the name. Rufus. He looks like a Rufus. I'm Rini, I whisper. His eyes are instantly back on me, staring down my face, like just a look from him could kill. I bet he makes every animal in the forest run screaming with that look. You are one tough little owl, I think to him. 
You can do this, Rufus. You got. You can get better. You making friends, Beatrice? Beatrice had, has returned with a plate full of dripping wet diced meat. Rufus needs a friend. Rufus? He looks like a Rufus. I scooped. I scooched up to sit on my butt and reached out to a hand for the food. Beatrice hesitates, but then gives it to me. I open the crate door and slip the plate in. Rufus' eyes, Rufus's eyes don't leave me. He doesn't make a move towards the food either. Do you think he knows what we, what we just gave him, I asked? He knows, she says. She kneels down, peeks in on Rufus. He might be too weak to eat. My heart cramps hearing her say that. But this is my owl, and we're in this fight together. So what do I do? You, Beatrice eyebrows lifted. She lowered a towel over the crate's door. Maureen, this is different than with Red. This is a wild bird. It doesn't understand what's happening to it. It's scared, and it will lash out. You need to promise me you'll leave this owl alone. Let me handle it. My jaw clenches down so hard. I worry my teeth might shatter. Who is this lady to get between me and Rufus? But I can help you. You let me hold him. I give her a Rufus glare. Maureen, I'm a licensed rehabber. I can't. Please, I snap. She considers the situation a moment longer, and then maybe she finally gets that there's no way I'm not doing anything and everything to make Rufus better, because she stands and grabs something from the table at the end of the room. Here, she says, and hands me a pair of long metal tongs. Pick up a tidbit and hold it out to him. She lifts the towel and opens the crate door. Just removing that metal wall sends tingles all over me. I pinch a bit of meat between the, from the plate with the tongs and hold it out to Rufus. He's looking at me the whole time. He doesn't even seem to notice the food. I give it a shake and nearly lose the tidbit from my tongs. Imagine if two giant feathered monsters plucked you out of the grass, stuffed you in a box, and started poking you. You might not want to take your eyes off them for a minute. She's right. I have to get into my bird brain, my owl brain. What do I even know about owls? He's glaring at me, but when I move, he moves his whole head to follow, not just his eyes. Can he move his eyes? I wonder if he can even see the tidbits that's close. I decide to try something I saw in one of the YouTube videos I watched about training hawks. I rubbed the tidbit right up against Rufus's beak. That startled him a little, but he snapped onto the tidbit and gulped it down. Good, Beatrice says, kneeling beside me like a coach. Now, try a second bite. I get him to eat everything on the plate. He seems sated, at least. His eyes are slightly less terrified and slightly more satisfied. And I did that. See, I said to Beatrice, I helped. You did, she says. Though in a way that sounds like maybe she thinks this was a fluke. So I can help you? I want guarantees. She glanced in at Rufus. Looks like I don't have a choice. Her mouth quirks up at the corners. She doesn't look or sound angry. She almost sounds happy. Whatever. Can I stay with them? She flips the towel over the door. If you want, she leaves. I peek in through the strip of grating along the side of the crate. Rufus is staring right at me like he knew I'd be here. I spend the whole rest of the afternoon just sitting there, watching him, watching me. Chapter 8. Rufus The furless creature has fallen asleep. Its bare face is half covered by the frizz of brown hair that sprouts from its head. It is my chance. I must escape this cave and find a place to pellet. The cave is larger than any tree hole I've lived in, but that doesn't mean I'm going to foul my nest. There are standards to be maintained, even for the absolute worst great horned owl in all of owldom. I creep forward, and the cave shifts. Its walls groan and scratch. This cave does not seem to be stable. The opening of the cave is blocked by some kind of web, the same web that was protecting the mouse that trapped me. My talons are no use on it. Pellets. So I'm stuck in here. The furless creature is going to force me to foul my nest. I will not stand for this. My screech has woken it up. It pushes aside the skin that hung down over the outside of the web and peers in at me, growls something. It looks away, howls for its mate, the big one with the gray fur tail dangling off its head. 
that would be your aunt with her gray, long gray ponytail that she braids. They grumble to each other. I keep up the chatter to remind them that things are desperate. He needs to pellet. That means he needs to poop. <laughs> they must remove this web. The one with the gray tail kneels in front of the cave and fiddles with the web. Some agreement must have been reached regarding my freedom. It grabs my feet in one thick, rough paw, wraps the other around my wings so I have no chance to fly, and carries me across what appears to be an even larger cave that my small nest cave is inside to another small cave in the opposite corner. So these are my options. Pellet in this nest or pellet in my own. These furless creatures are ruthless. The first chance I get, I'm escaping this nightmare. Once I have expelled my pellet, the gray tail snatches me up and puts me back in my nest cave. The web is, the web is resealed over its opening. The brown frizz creature resumes its watch. I've seen animals play with their meals, but, this, but these furless creatures are taking things to an extreme. First, I'm poked and stretched and blustered by the smallish one with the black fur on its head. Then, these two put me in this cave, within a cave. I sense other owls have been trapped in here, or at least other birds. There are talon scratches on the walls of the cave. Is this what happens to happen to my mother? She was taken by a furless creature. The shadowy silhouette that emerged from the rumbling monster was the same as these creatures' forms. And now, having been inside a rumbling monster myself, I realize that she was not eaten by the monster. She was, or will be, eaten by the furless creature. I wish Mother were here. I mean, not that she should be trapped with me or eaten, but just that if we're both to be trapped and eaten, I wish we could have been trapped and eaten together. This is how bad things are. My one wish is to die with my mother at the hands of these skin monsters. I huddle as far from the cave's web as I can get and glare at the furless creature. I may be the absolute worst great horned owl in all of owldom, but I am still a great horned owl. I will not be taken down without a fight. The furless creature has produced a squarish flat rock that glows like moonlight on water. It taps the flat stone with its featherless winged toes. The light flashes and noise comes out of the rock. It sounds like great beak. There are owls in that stone. I start chirping quietly. Maybe the furless creature won't notice. Maybe the owls will hear me and bring help. But the furless creature notices. It puts the flat rock down and the rock goes dark. The other owls cease to hoot. Pellets. The furless creature growls softly, all the while staring at me with its tiny brown eyes. It pinches a bit of mouse in its long, sharp, shiny, removable claw and shoves the morsel in through the web. No way, skin monster, I squawk, clacking my beak and retreating to the back of the cave. I will not fatten myself up for its dinner. The furless creature can go choke on a bone. But the furless creature is undeadered. To its growl, it growls again, puts its face right up to the web, and then it does the strangest thing. It eats a nut, or at least something squishy and squarish that smells nutty, and right in front of my cave. I may not be able to smell much, but I can smell that. It chomps away on nuts like some overgrown squirrel that sheds its fur like a leaf tree in winter. This creature is taunting me. Then again, it seems to really be enjoying those nuts. Could it be that the furless creature is not keeping me here to eat me? The smallest creature with the black hair on its head did seem to be surrounded by all sorts of animals. I heard everything from a rabbit snuffle to a coyote snort while in its cave. My wing does feel less hot and stingy after whatever the creature did to it, and the creatures were awfully nice about not making me foul my nest earlier. Could it be that the furless creatures help other creatures and eat nuts? The furless creature puts its nuts away. It slips one big rough paw over its naked little winged toes and then picks up a mouse morsel. It fiddles with the web and then the web opens a crack. The paw reaches in with the mouse. The meat does look good and I am a bit peakish. I chance a step towards the paw. The paw holds still. 
The mouse beckons with a sanguine odor. I chance another step. The noise of the furless creature's huge heart pounding in its chest rattles my skull. What is it so nervous about? Stretching my beak, I snap onto the morsel and gobble it down. The creature gives off an excited squeal. It slips the paw back out of the cave, grabs another mouse morsel, and slowly, ever so slowly, moves the mouse towards me. That one bite got my gizzard screeching. I snap at the paw. The creature grumbles, pulls the paw back. Is it afraid of my beak? I ruffle my feathers, lay back my ear tufts. Okay, furless creature, I chirp. I promise I will not bite your paw. The creature must understand owlish's owlish because it slowly brings the paw closer to me. I let it get right up near my beak and then carefully, not scraping even a scrap of that doofy paw, peck the morsel off the paw and gobble it down. The creature squeaks again. Its face contorts into this creepy sneer. It looks happy, though. Its heart has slowed down. This is what it wants? To have me nibble off its paw? There's a hoot in my head that is an, that is unbecoming of a great horned owl to eat off an animal's paw. Then again, I am the absolute worst great horned owl ever. And I am still feeling off, weak and thirsty and hungry as a bear coming out of its sleep cave. Perhaps eating off a paw is not such a bad thing. Perhaps given recent events, I don't ha give a hoot whether it's becoming or not. The creature grabs some more mouse with its paw, and we go back and forth like this, me carefully nibbling off the paw, the creature squeaking with delight at each bite, until I am as full as I have ever been in my life. When I can't suffer another beakful, I hoot quietly. That'll be good. That'll be good morning. And shuffles to the back of the cave, where I've scrunched up the thin, nubby, matted fur on the bottom of the cave into a bit of a nest. I snuggle down into myself, let my eyelids drift up, and catch the furless creature outside the web snuggling down into itself, its eyelids drooping. It's nice to go to sleep with another heartbeat in your ears, even if it is the heartbeat of a giant furless beast. <laughs> Chapter 9. Rini. Beatrice wakes me with a shake of the shoulders. You slept here all night? I wipe sleep from my eyes. I don't mind sleeping on the floor. I push myself up onto my elbows. Rufus is still snoozing at the back of the crate. You fed the owl again? She picks up the empty blood-smeared plate I used last night. He ate off the glove, I say, the words bringing the excitement back in a wave. Beatrice does not look quite as pleased. You stuck your hand in that crate? Only with my glove on, I curled my knees into my chest. He wouldn't eat off the tongs. Maureen, I said, you can help. Help means help me, which means I have to be here if you do anything. But he was hungry, and nothing happened. Beatrice kneels down, looks in on Rufus. He's weak, so he's not going to put up as much of a fight. But trust me, birds of prey are not pets. If he wanted to, he could do some real damage with those talons. She holds out her arm, which bears a few roundish talon-shaped scars. I'm not stupid, I say. I don't want a lecture. I thought the whole point was to try to train a hawk. A hawk, she says, getting a little loud, not a great horned owl. Owls are notoriously hard to train. Plus, it's illegal. This is a rehab bird. We make him better, and then we release him back out to his wild life. I need to know you'll follow my rules with this. You can't just do whatever comes into your head. There's a bird's life at stake, and your own safety, she adds. She stares at me and I glare back, but the buzz fires up. What if she sends Rufus away, gives him to Dr. Cho or some other rehabber because of me? I just wanted him to eat something. My stomach has wrenched into a fist. I won't do it again. Beatrice's shoulders slumped. I'm not angry, she says. I just, I don't want you or the bird to get hurt. I was careful, I whisper. She sighs, turns the plate in her hands. I'm sure you were, she says, and stands. She walks the plate into the kitchen. I sit there, curled tight, and watch Rufus sleep. It's dark in here, even with the door open a crack. 
but I can tell from the light in the kitchen that the sun's been up for a while. What time is it, I ask, stretching my legs. Beatrice doesn't answer. I hear water running. My foot kicks the table. I burrow the, the table I borrowed last night to research owls. I tap the screen. It's past nine. I jump up and scramble into the kitchen. Don't we have to get to Rutland? Visitation started 15 minutes ago. Beatrice turned off the water. The social worker called. Your mom? She wasn't feeling great. Is she sick? She was... She had to go back to the hospital. I hold my face together, but something inside me wilts. For a whole month at the treatment center, she'd been doing better. Now she's back in the hospital. Obviously, this has something to do with me. I should never have told her about Phil and the plate. I've been taking care of mom for my whole life. How could I have been so careless and let that slip? I wandered up to my room and sit down at the desk. When mom's at the hospital, the only way to communicate is by letter. I turn to a clean sheet of paper in my math notebook. I start to write. Dear mom, I shouldn't have said what I said about Phil and the plate. It's totally healed. I don't even think there's a scar. I'm sorry you're in the hospital. Please get better. For good this time. I cross out the last line. Then I cross out the whole thing. I rip the paper and throw it across the room. Then I throw the whole notebook across the room. I walk back down to the bird room. That's what I'm calling it. Why call it a dining room when the only one dining in it is a bird? I sit down and face Rufus, who's still snoozing. I am toxic. Mom is in the hospital again because of me. Beatrice is already tired of me. I can tell from her voice. It's only been a week. I should probably leave this owl alone before I ruin him too. That thought cracks through the others. The buzz sizzles up my spine. Alone. Tears spring out. Alone. And homeless. Mom told me I can't go back to Graham's. How much longer will Beatrice let me stay here? I give it another week. I'm sorry, Beatrice says. I didn't even notice her following me in here. No, no, tears. I strangle the sadness, push it back. It's not your fault my mom's been locked up. Fine, no one wants me. I can, get, I can go it alone, live in the wild, live in the wild like Sam in my side, of, my side of the mountain book. Beatrice kneels down beside me. It's not anyone's fault, Maureen. She looks me square in the eyes. And she's not locked up. She's getting help. Beatrice holds out a Pop-Tart. The buzz of alone bounces around the emptiness inside me. Who's going to help me? I take the Pop-Tart. Should we make wake Rufus up? He'll wake up when he, need, when he needs something. I need him to wake up to give me something to focus on that's not in my head. Eat, Beatrice says, laying a hand on my shoulder. I almost jump out of my skin. It's crazy how nice it is to have a, to feel a hand on my shoulder right now. I take a bite of the Pop-Tart. It's warm and just the right kind of crumbly. Five seconds, I scarf the whole thing down. I do feel better. Beatrice pats my shoulder. I'll get you the other one. She stands and leaves the room. Rufus coos softly, ruffling his feathers. What if I save this owl? What if I prove he can be trained? Imagine if, he sh if we show her, Rufus. Imagine when she sees us soaring together. Then she'll understand. Then she'll let us stay. We'll show her, I think to Rufus. Beatrice brings me the other Pop-Tart on a plate. I take it, curl up in my fleece blanket, and tap on the tablet. Search Owl Falconry Training. I find listservs, YouTube videos, web pages. I put in my earbuds and start my research. One thing that's cool about living with Beatrice is that she's not nosy. She moves around her house doing her own thing, first reading, then cleaning Red's muse. So she doesn't bother me until dinner when she knocks softly on the door and says, I made food. I've sketched out a whole plan for training Rufus at night in secret, and then by the time his wing is healed, we'll be such an amazing falconry team that Beatrice will have no choice but to get permission to fly him as our passage bird this season. I put the tablet away and stand. My legs are tingly and wobbly. I guess I need to move around more. Beatrice is sitting at the kitchen table eating some kind of soup, and I join her. Rufus slept all day, I say, flopping into the chair. He's exhausted, she says, slurping a spoonful. 
The injury didn't seem that old, but he was pretty hungry. He was probably stressed and starving for a few days. That would tire out any bird. I take a bite of soup. She says it's like this only she says it like this only happens to birds. I've been stressed and hungry for more than a few days before. Red missed you at feeding time. She stirs her soup around the bowl. What have you been doing all day? I worked past feeding time. Yikes. Um, reading stuff about owl rehabilitation. She smiles a little. My daughter used to get that look. What look? I asked, feigning innocence. There's no way she can know about my secret plan. And then my brain processes the more important facts that, sh that was just revealed. You have a daughter, I say, like a person who has totally not been snooping about. She would, she can't know I saw the pictures. Beatrice swirled the soup. She's older now, moved out west with her father after the divorce. The buzz whispers, not your room. I'm in her room, aren't I? It hasn't been her room in years, Beatrice says, taking a bite. The buzz hisses, not your home. But if she comes to visit, Beatrice smiles, but this time it's more of a wince. She hasn't visited in years. The buzz fizzles away to nothing. I'm okay for now. Rufus and I have time. Then I notice Beatrice look, looks on the verge of tears. Can't handle another sad grown-up in my life. I scoop soup into my face, clear my bowl, and head back into the bird room. Rufus is awake. He blinks his great golden eyes at me. He needs to do his business, I'm sure. Hey, Beatrice, I called. I think Rufus needs to barf up that gross lump. Casting, she calls back, her chair scraping across the floorboards. Her bowl clatters in the sink, and then she's in the bird room pulling on her gloves, or pellet. An owl cast a casting or pellet. He probably needs to do all his business. Of course, he's the first bird I've ever rehabbed that got fussy about pooping in his, in his crate. Rufus is a gentleman, I say, because he so obviously is. He would never do something so gross as poop where he sleeps. I open the crate, grateful to see her focused and real smiling, not fake smiling. Beatrice reaches in and grabs Rufus around his feet and wings. I grab the dirty towel from the bottom of the crate, snap open a fresh one, and stuff it in. Beatrice steps towards the second crate, but then decides on a different path. Close the door to the kitchen, she says. I shut it, careful not to make too much noise. She holds Rufus out and lowers him to the perch in the center of the room. It's a rubber-coated metal ring on a metal stick standing up out of a heavy base. Rufus reaches out his talons and grabs the ring. He stands there, blinks a few times, then begins to teeter. He squawks, lifts his wings, and is about to stretch them straight but Beatrice lowers her gloves around him. He's still too weak, she says. We can try again tomorrow. My heart is racing from watching him. He almost perched. He also almost tipped over on his feet. Try what again? The first step in manning a bird is getting it to trust you and sit calmly in your presence. Manning? That's a falconing term. Do you mean, I ask? I get the sense you're going to train him whether I help you or not. She lowers him into the second crate. It's probably better if I help you. This warm tickles up from my belly button. You serious? I dare to ask. Are you? She asks me, really digging in with, with her eyes. She is serious. She's going to help me do this. I nod my head in a most serious fashion. I have a whole plan. I begin, then pull out my notebook and show her all my notes. She nods as she reads. So this is what you've been doing all day. A part of me worries that maybe I didn't do enough, that maybe she needs some proof. He's already eating off the glove, I say, pointing to the steps of my notebook. Once he's strong enough, I could try feeding him while having him perch on the glove. I see the corner of her mouth tick up. Let's see if we can get him standing on a perch, period. The corner of my mouth hitches up to match hers. Okay. That promise, just to try, is enough for now. Monday morning, I don't open my eyes until almost noon. Rufus had me up all night with his squawking and chirping. Beatrice and I fed him a bunch of tidbits from the glove, though, and he didn't snap at me once. I'm calling it progress. I scramble off the floor where I'd camp near Rufus's crate. 
The house is silent, the bird room dark and cool. I find Beatrice sitting in the kitchen reading. You didn't wake me for school, I said. I asked, bewildered. No school, she says, flipping a page of her book. It's Labor Day. I pull a chair out, sit. Oh, I thought we could take Red for a walk. She takes a sip of her iced tea, calm and unhurried. Last Labor Day, there was a crazy loud barbecue at Graham's place. I climbed up into the stubby apple tree with a bag of chips to get away from the crowds of kids running between the trailers. I must have fallen asleep there in the branches. When Mom found me to go home, back when we still had a home, the sky was purple and my ears rang with the echoes of the party's music. I've never lived somewhere so still, so quiet as Beatrice's. Against the stillness, the buzz inside me is a low growl. I thought it only showed up when I'm freaking out. I've never noticed it before when I'm just sitting. But there it is, that engine that's always running, always alert. There are some parts of yourself you only find in the quiet. I take a deep breath, try to slow the buzz. Alone, alone, it chugs out. Beatrice takes another sip of iced tea. The condensation beads and runs down the sides of the glass. She flips another page. Outside, the wind tickles the leaves. A bird calls. In that stillness, I tell the buzz, silently, only in my head, you can rest. And for a heartbeat, it's gone. I'm a buttercup soaking up the sun. A car blasts down the road, blaring music and kicking up a cloud of dust that covers all the front windows. The buzz returns, but oh, that moment. Beatrice folds a corner of her page, puts down her book. You ready? Let me grab a granola bar, I say, pushing my chair back. She nods. I'll meet you out back. After the walk, I go downstairs and find my math notebook in the corner of the room where I'd thrown it. I take it to the desk, open it to a smooth, clean sheet of paper. Alone, alone, pulses down my arms through my fingertips. I focus on the quiet, on the breeze billowing the curtain, on the late afternoon light, warm on my skin. When the quiet reaches all the way inside, I try again. Dear Mom, I love you. I miss you. See you soon. Rini. I leave the letter in the mailbox with the flag up. Monday night is another marathon feeding session with Rufus. Beatrice even goes to bed and lets me feed him on my own. It seems silly to have to keep sticking my glove into his house. I could just let him walk out and stretch his wings, but the buzz fires up and I can't. What if Beatrice finds out? What if I hurt him? So I feed Rufus off the glove again until he won't eat another bite, and then I just lie there watching him and try, desperately, painfully, to be patient. Everyone can turn in their homework at the end of the class, the teacher, Mr. Brown, says Tuesday morning, and my brain vaguely recalls that there had been homework, which is definitely not done. Oh, well, that's one good thing about this life being temporary. My grades won't matter once I leave this school. We're going to start this year by looking at what makes our state unique, he continues. I want you to come up with something about living in Vermont that's important to you. You've researched its, you'll research its history and then interview someone about it. We'll spend class today working in groups to come up with an idea. Nothing is more terrifying than the group project, especially for the new kid. People start clumping together like dust bunnies. I shrink into my seat. I'm not sure what would be worse, someone asking me to join their group or not being asked to join any group. Hey, I look up and there's Jackson. Relief floods through me. Yes, definitely, I say before he even has a chance to ask. I pull the neighboring desk next to mine. Sit here. Jackson sits, pulls out his whittling. I monitor the remaining students as the clumping slows. Some boys have joined together and are making fart noises with their hands. Jackson and I are safe. Can I work with you guys or not? She snuck up behind us. Sure, Jackson says, making the room. Jamie pulls over a chair. Thanks. She smiles her shiny white teeth at me. Excellent, Mr. Brown says. Everyone take out some paper and start brainstorming topics. Let's hear more talking, less farting. This gets a chuckle, but the fart noises keep coming for at least another minute. Oh, Jamie says and digs in her backpack. Here, she slaps a new comic book, still wrapped in plastic, on the desk. Jackson's eyes brighten. He puts the wood down. Whoa! 
He gently lifts the shiny packet and begins examining the cover. It's a comic, I say, becoming serious. Be because seriously, why is he getting worked up over a comic book? It's a first edition Avengers, Jamie says, raising her eyebrows like this means something. Jackson and I were comparing our collection last week, and he didn't believe that I had a first edition. It's really my dad's, but still. She holds out a hand like, ta-da. Do you collect comics, she asked me. No. Who has money for comics and books? Oh, well, she says, fidgeting with the end of her braid. My dad and I, we collect them. Well, he collected them, and then he let me sort of latch on to his collection, collecting. This girl seems to latch on to anything that passes by. She continues talking. I've tried to draw my own. I went to a cartooning camp, but my comics are still terrible. I can never come up with a good team. Oh, my gosh, we should totally come up with a team name. Not Avengers, I say. Cartooning camp? Is this girl for real? Of course not Avengers, Jamie says, snorting this little laugh. Though, if we were the Avengers, I think Jackson would be Cap, and maybe you would be I'm Bruce Banner, Jackson interrupts, gingerly sliding the comic book towards Jamie, like it's made of glass. My mom called me the Hulk when I was little. She's the one who got me into marbles. No way, Jamie explains. I can't even imagine you. Mr. Brown appears over us. How are things coming along with you all? Have a topic yet? I have never been more relieved to see a teacher. It would have been better to have worked on my own than watch the one person I sort of thought was okay get sucked up by Miss Comic Book Collection. I thought, Jackson says, shoving the whittling into his pocket, we could maybe do hunting. Jamie pales. I'm a vegetarian. I thought falconry, I suggested strongly. That's a kind of hunting, Jackson offers. So hunting it is, I say, flashing a triumphant smile at Jamie. She's not a hunter, not like Jackson and me. Maybe there's another group you'd like to join, I say, but at the same time, Jackson's all. Hunting isn't just about killing animals and eating meat. It's about wildlife management. My dad says hunting keeps the deer herd at healthy numbers. Oh, Jamie says. I kind of feel bad about how freaked out Jamie looks, and falconry about birds, I added. Oh, Jamie says, and she gives me that little half smile. Why is she smiling? We're still doing hunting. Maybe it wasn't the topic that was freaking her out. Maybe it was me. Mr. Brown nods. We have a hunting group a couple years ago. I think that's a great idea. He hands us a blank assignment sheet, tells us to start outlining what we're going to do for the project and to assign everyone a job, then announces to the class that we'll be in the library doing research for the rest of the week. I don't know anything about hunting, Jamie says, tucking a strand of hair into her mouth. I hunt, Jackson says, and my dad's a game warden with the Fish and Wildlife Department. He can help. I've learned a bunch of stuff training a hawk. I stopped myself from mentioning Rufus just in time. If Jackson's dad is with the Fish and Wildlife Department, that means he's in charge of making sure falconers follow the rules, such as not training owls. The last thing I need is another state agency involved in my life. Jamie has chewed the strands of her hair so it's tight against her head. I guess the whole point of the project is to learn something. She releases the strand and it's like a switch flip. She's perky again. I'll, it'll be great. We're back on track, I guess. So Mr. Brown said to assign jobs. Maureen should be the leader, Jackson says. Me? Did he just say leader? I can see her as Nick Fury, Jamie says. And I don't know if that's an insult or what. She's She's more of a Tony Stark, Jackson replies. Iron Man, I ask, finally comprehending something. Right, Jamie says, smiling at me. I'm a dog who's just mastered, like I'm a dog who's just mastered sit. Maureen's our Iron Man. Iron Woman, Jackson says with authority. A chuckle escapes Jamie's lips. This weird smile tickles the corners of my mouth. I write, Maureen La Esperance. Iron Woman, under hunting, on our assignment sheet, and the smile grows. I mean, it's not like I care or anything. This is just a stupid school project. But still, it's kind of cool to be the Iron Woman of any group. 
At the end of the day, the teacher lets us spend the last 15 minutes of the period outside. Jackson and I are just settling in behind our bush, our whittling wood poised for sculpting, when Jamie comes crashing through the brush. Hi, she says, all sing-songy. She plops down beside Jackson and hefts a giant book from her backpack. I've got this history of comic books out from the library. We've got to see the old covers. You've got to see the old covers for the Marvel, Captain Marvel. She opens the book and Jackson leans in, dropping his whittling in the leaves. Cool, he says, like we weren't in the middle of something ourselves. Who is this girl to barge in with her comic book collection when Jackson and I were perfectly happy whittling together in silence? I shove my whittling into my backpack and pull out the book on owls I took out. I try to flip pages loudly enough so that they can't hear Jamie and Jackson ooing and aahing over their stupid comics. Hey, Jamie says, Maureen, look, there really is an Iron Woman. Rescue, Jackson says, one of my mom's favorites. And a part of me wants to toss my book aside and lean in because I'm Iron Woman. I'm Jackson's mom's favorite. But then the buzz whispers, friends are dangerous. What happens if they ask about my mom? How do I explain that the only thing I've ever collected was addresses? Huh? I say, like I was so in into my reading, I didn't hear a word they said. Like what they were talking about doesn't even matter to me. Oh, sorry, Jamie says, her voice shrinking. I just thought, I really need to read this, I said. It's research. I waggle the book so they can see how thick and imposing a tomb it, it is. Jackson gives me this confused look, then turns back to Jamie. They go on flipping pages, but there's no more ooing and aahing. The three of us silently flip pages like it's a punishment. I manage to suck the fun out of the entire world. Typical me. The bell rings. See you guys later, Jamie says, getting up. See you, Jackson says, following her. Sure, I say. The bus can't drive fast enough. The farther I get from school, the farther I am from all the drama. Like I meant to ruin their conversation. Like I even wanted friends. I get home and burst into the kitchen. Beatrice isn't home yet. I hear Rufus squawking. This drama I can handle. I drop my backpack, wash my hands, and crack open the door to the bird room. Rufus is chittering and chirping and clacking his beak. Owls are super noisy. I would not have guessed this going in with the whole rehabilitating an owl thing, but I've learned a ton. For example, I know this owl needs to pellet. I look out the window, the side window, then the front. I have no idea when Beatrice will be home. Rufus squawks again, louder. I'm not going to make Rufus suffer. All right, buddy, I say, slipping on Beatrice's leather work gloves. He shuffles into the center of the crate. His wings are tight against his back, and he gives me a slow blink of his yellow eyes. I open the crate door and slip my hands in to grab his feet, but they're hidden under his long chest feathers. Why bother digging for feet when I can just hold his wings? I get my gloves around him and lift him up. See? Perfectly fine. I probably should not be doing this without Beatrice. This is a step beyond feeding, but Rufus has stopped screaming. This is what he needed. I carry him to the other crate, his barf and bathroom, as I call it, as I'm calling it. I shut him inside, and lo and behold, he shuffles to the back, silently pukes up a pellet, and then poops. Owl poop is called whitewash. It's still poop. See? I can do things. I'm a leader. Take that, Tony Stark. Rufus steps to the front of the crate and stands there staring at me. I open the crate door and get my hands around his wings. I decide to try reaching around his back so I won't have his talons facing my chest. I can just get my fingers all the way around his wings. Now I'll just stand and kind of turn Rufus and lift, careful of the tufts, yes, up and out of the crate and take a step. My foot hooks the perch on the floor mid-stride and I'm tripping before I can even process what's happening. My hands drop Rufus to break my fall, but Rufus doesn't drop. He flaps and shrieks, then kind of glides to the floor. He begins screeching and pulsing his wings. He gets some air, and now I realize why Beatrice was, had been so careful. Rufus is actually quite large, like an umbrella come to life, an umbrella equipped with sharp and powerful talons. 
a distraught owl flapping and squawking and bumbling about a small enclosed space is terrifying. I hit the floorboards and cover my head with my gloves. What in the... Beatrice stands in the doorway. Oh, no. She quickly closes the door behind her and pulls on a glove. She warned me. What will she do? The buzz cranks up to a deafening roar. I should have waited. I'm such an idiot. My eyes sting. Rufus lands on the arm of the couch and screeches. Did he hurt his wing? He glares at me. I totally deserve that. Beatrice pauses against the wall. I am frozen on the floor. A tear drips off the tip of my nose, splattering on the floorboards. This is all my fault. What if Beatrice sends him away? What if Beatrice sends me away? The buzz roars. Rufus turns his head, considers the room, the two humans. He bobs his head a few times, then he fluffs his feathers out until he looks like an upended dust mop and begins nipping at them with his beak. He slides his beak over his, each feather and like he's smoothing the seams of a jacket. He's okay. I didn't hurt him. He's okay. He's preening, Beatrice whispers. I dropped him, I confess, still not moving from the floor. You should have waited, Beatrice sticks by the wall. I know, I whisper, then added louder, but he sounded really mad. He cast up a pellet the second I put him in the poop crate. You should have waited, she repeats a bit more sharply. I bang my forehead on the floor. Of course I should have waited. Beatrice appears beside me, having tiptoed over, silent as a ghost. She places a palm on my shoulder. Look. I drag my head up. It's like hefting a stone. Rufus finished his preening and settles onto his perch. His lower eyelids slide up. He's sleepy. He can perch, Beatrice whispers. He's feeling better? There's a tiny lift inside me. She gives a little shrug to say, I don't know, but he can perch. Rufus poops down the arm of the couch and moot. Both good signs. I'm sorry, I say. She nods. I know. The buzz inside quiets. We sit there for a while, just watching Rufus snooze. Then Beatrice unfolds her legs. I should get dinner started. What about Rufus? If he's perching, he doesn't need to be in the crate, which means he needs anklets and Jessie's. Jess's. She considers Rufus, who twitters softly. I need to eat before trying that. We creep out of the bird room together, careful not to disturb Rufus. I sit at the kitchen table while Beatrice throws something together to eat. I can't believe how chill she was about me almost killing Rufus. How cool she is about it. No yelling, not even now that we're away from the bird room. I decided to offer her something in exchange. I have a project at school, I say. We're in groups researching something about Vermont that's important to us. My group is doing hunting. But you don't hunt, Beatrice said, shaking some spices into the pot. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't have said anything. She stirs the whatever she's making. Then she puts the spoon aside and comes to the table. I'm betting your part of this project is about falconry. She looks me right in the eye. I nod. I bet there's not one person in your class who's even heard of the sport. It's a great project. A little smile quirks up the corner of my mouth. It's not like I care what she thinks about the project, but I mean, it's nice to hear that she, or anyone, thinks it's great. You hunt with Red, right? I ask. That's part of my deal with Red. I scare the prey out of the brush so she can catch it. Even though you're vegetarian, I ask, remembering Jamie's complaint. Red eats the meat. She goes back to the stove to tip to tip her spoon in and taste her creation. It's just nature running its course. Bird of prey eats prey. Can I interview you? I say it quickly, forcing the words out. Asking for favors is not my thing. It's for the project. I have to interview a hunter. Beatrice frowns, eyebrows raised. I've never been interviewed before. I've never interviewed anyone before, I say. She shrugs. So we'll learn together. Her smile coaxes one out of my own face. We chow down on pasta and some vegetable sauce. Human of earth eats plants. Once we're done, Beatrice and I head back into the bird room. Rufus cracks open his eyes, sees it's us, and goes back to sleep. Beatrice stops at the little table and begins sorting her tools. She snips leather, picks out some metal rings. She calls grommets, then pulls out these long strips of 
with knots at one end, the Jesses. She places her hand on her hips, surveys her collection. I'm going to need you to hold him. I can hold him, I say, my voice a whisper. The buzz rages. What if I fail again? What if this time I drop him and he breaks a bone? Hey, Beatrice says, looking straight into my eyes. I wouldn't ask you to do it if I didn't think you could it. I nod. She thinks I can handle it. Maybe I can. Let's do this, she hands me a towel. We both put on work gloves and walk calmly over to Rufus so we don't startle him. Beatrice gently grabs Rufus around the legs and wings. His eyes flash open and the feathers along his beak lift. His beak gapes and he starts hissing like an angry snake. Beatrice jerks her chin, which is my cue, to toss the towel over Rufus's head. It lands on him and the hissing stops. His claws dig into the couch, but Beatrice just holds him steady until his talons release. Then she carries him to the table. Get a good grip on him, she says, shifting her hold to let me get my hands around his body. Hold, I hold him on his back on the table. Beatrice slips off the bulky gloves and grabs his legs between her fingers to keep from getting slashed by a talon. With a few quick movements, she slips the leather smooth side in around Rufus's leg, punches the grommet through the strip, and cuts the ends, then does the same thing on the other side. In another 30 seconds, long jesses dangle from the grommets. Beatrice holds them out, judges their length against Rufus's tail, and then snips them. I'm done, she says, stepping back and wiping her forehead with her sleeve. That was incredible, I say. She moves so fast, like a robot. This is not my first bird, she says. She's smiling, though. I think she's a little psyched that she did so well. Rufus clacks his beak. He probably does not like being on his back. I lift him upright. Whoa, Beatrice says. She slides on her gauntlets, gathers the jesses in her gloves, makes a fist, and puts the gauntlet right under Rufus's feet. His talons grab on. I let go. And it happens. She's holding Rufus on her fist. Can I... I begin, arm already drifting towards his talons. Rufus flips out. He drops backwards off Beatrice's fist and starts flapping madly as he dangles from the jesses. The towel falls off and I see his bright yellow eyes and pinhole pupils. He is not happy. But Beatrice is cool as a creamy. She scoops Rufus up by the chest and sets him back on her fist. That's called baiting. Perfectly normal. Rufus seems confused, but also grateful to be right side up. He looks at her, shuffles his feet, looks at me, ruffles his feathers, and then just stands there. Beatrice smiles. He's doing it, I say. And then he jumps off her fist again, and she sets him right again, and I realize that this is going to be a long road that's full of potholes. Chapter 10, Rufus. The furless creatures have made me a part of their nest. They have tied strips of animal skin to my legs, which I assume is an owl adaption version of the funny animal skin bladders they wear over their talonless shoes, toes. I would have preferred if they would have asked me formally, perhaps, presented some choice bit of food. But then again, I did roost in the cave they provided for me, so maybe they were confused. I'm not actually against the little strips, as they do have a shiny bit that sparkles, but I am rather upset about the tails that dangle from the shiny bits. The tails get tangled, and then I end up hanging like a bat. Even the absolute worst great horned owl in all of owldom is above a fruit-sucking, bug-scarfing bat. At least, I would like to think this is true. The creature with the brown frizz is asleep on the soft, rock-shaped mound near the wall. The gray tail put a fluffy skin over her. I have determined that these are female mam that these are female mammalian creatures, perhaps large, furless, tailless descendants of squirrels. Regardless, I would like to run my beak through that fluffy skin covering her, but those tangly tails on my new legs sparkle are tied to an even longer vine, which is attached to this perch. I tried to fly a little when the brown frizz first fell asleep. I ended up beak first in the dust. Bah, this is so boring. The brown fizz frizz shifts under her skin. Come here and give me that skin, I squawk. 
The brown frizz opens her soft, pink, beakless maw and grumbles. I peck at the perch, try to give her some hints. Skin, I hoot. I want to peck it. The brown frizz shuffles out of the room but leaves the skin on the soft rock. You forgot the skin, I screeched. These furless creatures are not the brightest. She comes back with a dripping warm mouse. Well now, that's food, that food's here. I'm up for eating. I chomp that mouse down in one gulp. The brown frizz looks surprised. What, she didn't think I could eat a mouse whole? Just because I haven't had any many opportunities for such feasting doesn't mean I can't do it. Now, about that skin, I chirp. Trying a slightly different tone with the creature, I would like to rip it to shreds. Would you be so kind? The creature blows some air at her head fur. That's an odd display. I stretch my ear tufts. Maybe she's trying to communicate. The creature's face lights up. She waves her naked little winged toes up to her head fur. Is she trying to look like a great horned owl? Because she is failing miserably. I screech for her to stop this silliness. The skin, I snap. Bring it here. The creature looks around the room. How is she not understanding me? I'm being very clear. She crawls across the floor to a corner. But wait, are there other skins? I'm open to an offer of other skins if you would like to keep yours, I chirp. The creature crawls back. She has a longish, fattish root in her wing toes that has tufts of fur dangling from either end. What an odd little root. The creature waggles the root. It squeaks. Is there a mouse in that root? Creature, give me that root, I squawk, and then hop off the perch. The creature drops the root and shuffles away from me. Good, she knows her place. What a fascinating root. And so wonderful sh for shredding. I clench it in my talons. It is very squishy and, ho oh, there, it squeaked again. I dig into the root with my beak and claw. I tear the tiny tendrils that make up its fibers. It is so satisfying to shred. I am a great horned owl and I shred you, root. I tear the root to tufts, but there's no mouse in it. The squeaking comes from this strange foul tasting bladder when I spit, which I spit out. The brown frizz has fallen asleep again, this time on her featherless wing on the ground. I would wake her up to get me another root with an actual mouse inside, but she just seems like a tired creature. I hop onto a rock that the gray tail placed near my perch and moot, then hop back down and stomp into the little pool of water she left for me to cool my talons. Then I flutter up to the perch. Around me lie the ruins of the root. I have done well. I fluff my feathers and give them a straightening with my beak, getting everything back in order. Moonlight sneaks through the crack in the wall of the cave, and I can hear noise, night noises, crickets scratching their legs, bugs buzzing through the dark, a rabbit munching in the grass, and then I hear the call of an owl, not a great horned, but a big bird, a barred owl, a threat. But the threat is on the other side of the cave's wall. I shuffle my feet to get a better grip on the perch. Warm currents of air flow from the creature, and I concentrate on the thumping pulse of her heart. I know I'm not supposed to like living here, but an owl has to admit, this nest is snug. Chapter 11, Rini. Beatrice comes sneaking into the bird room to wake me up. My head weighs a thousand pounds, and I drooled all over my arm. But then I see my happy owl perched above the shredded remains of the rope dog toy, sleeping with one foot tucked up under his fluffy chest feathers. I thought I left you on the couch, Beatrice says. Rufus wants to play, I say, yawning. But then my heart jumps. That's okay, right? I didn't touch him. I stayed outside the tether. She smiles. It's okay, but you've got to hurry if you're going to catch the bus. I head for the bathroom, checking the time on the old clock in the living room. Crud, it's almost 7.15. I rush through my routine, toss on whatever's clean, and go to the kitchen in a flash. You need to remember that you're not an owl, Beatrice says, handing me a glass of juice. You have to go to school all day. He sleeps. Could you resist him hooting at you to play? 
I slug down the juice and take the Pop-Tart she offers. He, she snuffs and laughs. No, she says. I scarf the I scarf the Pop-Tart and the second one and then go for my backpack, which is still by the door. Did I have homework? Oh, I'll check on the bus ride. At school, I pull out the math worksheet I should have finished over the long weekend. The numbers swim on the pages. I'm so blurry-eyed. It's almost a relief when Jamie sits in the desk next to mine. Hey, I say, pushing aside the paper. She rummages in her backpack and then pulls out a round box and places it on my desk. It's an arc reactor, she says. Well, obviously not a real arc reactor, but um, I made it for you because I'm Tony Stark. I asked, picking it up. I've seen the movie. It's a short metal can with a clever screw on top that Jamie covered in silvers, slivers of silver stickers to make a pattern on the plastic. In the center is a triangle, triangle of wires. Jamie reaches over, over and pokes a finger at the bottom of the box, and the triangle blinks on. It's made of tiny LED lights. You made this, I ask? For me? I clarify. Her mouth shrugs up in a little smile. I like to make stuff. I click off the light, then on again. I haven't even been that nice to this girl, and she gives me a present? No, makes me a present? That lights up? Is she so desperate for friends that she's willing to settle for me? I hope it's okay, she says quickly. I mean, I'm sorry if it's weird. Maybe only some friends are dangerous. I'm the one who's being weird, I say. I'm sorry, about last week and yesterday. Oh, um, it's okay, she says, fidgeting with the end of her braid. It's not okay, I say. I click the arc, arc thingy off and on again. Thank you. This is awesome. She smiles so hard her cheeks nearly burst. Jackson slinks into the room and shuffles to his seat behind me. I brought in my fish and wildlife guide. He slaps the inch-thick slab of paper onto the desk. Jamie and I are both kind of stunned that there's an entire book of rules about hunting. We all three begin flipping through it, pointing and gasping at how insanely specific these rules are. And I kind of step outside myself for a second. I mean, I'm still sitting at my desk, still pointing at the tiny printed rules. You can't hunt a half an hour after sunset. How do you even know when, it, when that is? But I'm also like three inches above that me, noticing for the first time in a long time, I have friends. At the end of the day, I see Beatrice is parked outside the school to pick me up. I thought I was taking the bus, I say, opening the door of the truck. I have to pick up my food order, my order of food from the farm and yard. She puts down her book and starts the engine. We have our work cut out for us, prepping it all for the freezer. Was that a pun? Because gross, I say, sliding into the passenger seat. She snuffles a laugh. Not all of falconry is soaring with the falcons, she says, pulling out of the parking lot. Dr. Cho is going to stop by tonight, Beatrice says. It's time to check on her patient. What does that mean, I ask? Are you releasing him? What about slow down, she says, turning into the store lots. I'll th I'll th I think Rufus is ready to go out to the new mews. Outside? He's ready to have a little more space to stretch those wings as they heal. Rufus is screeching when we get home. Red is squawking from the backyard. Beatrice and I throw down our bags and start warming up mice. She hurries out to Red and I sneak into the bird room. Rufus is glaring at me, ears, ear tufts raised. He starts hissing and clacking his beak. Boy, he's in a crud mood. I slide on my gauntlet and approach slowly, calmly, quietly, just like all the books and videos say. I get low, stretch my hand towards his dish. Let's try something, Beatrice says. She must have snuck in after feeding Red. Put the mouse on your fist. The buzz crackles. But what if I'm not even sure what I'm afraid of, just that I'll mess it up and that I'll mess Rufus up? No buts, Beatrice says. I put the mouse on top of my fist between the fingers of the gauntlet. Rufus bobs his head, shuffles on the perch. I kneel down beside outside the reach of his tether. I stretch my hand forward. I whistle and flop the mouse around. Rufus screeches, flattens his ear tufts. Come on, I whisper. I whistle again, flip around the mouse. 
I move my fist closer. Rufus considers the mouse, considers the fist. He flaps a tiny hop and lands on my glove. Holy crud, I have an owl on my fist. Rufus pecks at the mouse and twitters and chirps happily, gross morsels of meat going into his beak. I freeze, too psyched to do anything else. He's heavier than Rufus, but still so light. His talons tighten and loosen as he takes up the mouse and begins choking it down whole. A feeling I can only call pure joy pulses through me with his grip. He trusts me. Gather his jesses, Beatrice unhooks the leash holding him to the perch and then shuffles away, gives me room. I use my free hand to tuck the jesses into the fingers of the fist with Rufus on it. Remember the jesses are the strings that hang down from the bands on the bird's feet. Grip them tight. He's going to bait once he finishes and you'll need to hold him. It's a difficult balance holding the bird while weaving my fingers around his jesses. And now I have, I have to also worry about him diving off my fist. Now sit back. This is some impossible gymnastics. That's it. I'm sitting. I'm sitting and Rufus is perched on my fist. He swallows down the rest of the mouse and then looks at me. He fluffs his feathers, lifts, and stretches his wings. I tense up, ready for him to bait. He glares at me. Can he sense my nerves? I bet he can. Yes, the books all talk about the needs for a falconer to exude calm. I take a deep breath. Two. Rufus's ear tufts lift. I take two more. My heart rate slows. The ear tufts relax. Rufus squeezes my hand through the glove. Excellent, Beatrice murmurs. I'm not sure how long we sit there. It feels like an eternity and also a single moment. The doorbell rings and Rufus instantly twists his head and screeches. I startle, shifting my fist. I have pins and needles in my arm from holding it still for so long. And then he baits. Rufus flies off my fist and hits the end of the jesses and my grip tightens. So he flops down, dangling from the strips. Don't panic, Beatrice says calmly. It's just Lil. She can let herself in. She gently lifts Rufus by his chest and places him back on my fist. He stamps and squeezes his talons and screeches and then settles. Beatrice smiles. You survived. I realize I haven't taken a breath since he baited. I suck in a gulp of air. Rufus baits again. Beatrice puts him back on my fist. Now you try, she says, showing me where my hand needs to go when he's hanging upside down. When Rufus baits the next time, I brave lifting him myself. I have to do this for Rufus. For me, too. I tuck my hand on his chest. He's so small and frail and light, and I'm totally going to crush him with my gargantuan fingers. But I don't. I set him back on the glove. Rufus rouses, settles, then poops. That's a good sign. The pride shines off Beatrice's face. A smile creeps along my lips. I did it. He pooped. Dr. Cho knocks softly and comes in. Am I interrupting? Beatrice waves her in, and together they give Rufus a thorough checkup. He's fine to go into the muse, Dr. Cho says, though you'll need to keep up with the, the, up the work of manning him if you're going to fly him. I nod. He perched on my fist is all I can think. He was comfortable enough with me to poop. I want to sprout wings and fly with Rufus. Dr. Cho and Beatrice go into the kitchen to start dinner. I sit on the couch with Rufus. He chirps at me. I stare at his perch area. All the books and web pages told me not to look directly at a predator bird such as a hawk, so I assume the same goes for the great horned owl. I have a lot of cleaning to do. There's a casting and whitewash running down the rock. There are a few feathers floating on top of the water in Rufus's bowl. I catch glimpses of Rufus on my, on my fist. He appears to just be hanging out, looking around the room, bobbing his head and at the slightest noise. Beatrice pokes her head in. Dinner. I nod. I walk carefully, crouching low in case Rufus makes a fly for it. Rufus floats across the floor on my outstretched arm. When I hold him next to his perch, he hops onto it and stands there while I fasten the leash to the end of his jesses. Then he rouses and begins to preen. He's happy. He knows he's home.
and we are going to move him outside. I bring this up at dinner. Isn't it kind of a betrayal, I ask nonchalantly, twirling spaghetti onto my fork. I mean, to get Rufus all fat and happy in the bird room and then toss him outside in the aviary? He's not a pet, Maureen, Beatrice says. He's going to have to get used to the outside sooner or later. In the end, we're sending him home. Home. The word lands hard in my gut. She may be talking about Rufus, but I hear the echo of this idea in my own life. Rufus and I are both here on a temporary basis. Only difference is, I don't have a home to be sent to. Alone, the buzz whispers. That's the next, what's the next step for me? What am I going to have to get used to? Great horned owls are kings of the night forest, Dr. Cho says, interrupting this terrible train of thought. Don't you worry about Rufus outside. It's the rest of the animal world that will be shaking in their fur. She smiles as she says this like she's made such a great joke. I guess the Avery will keep him safe, I say, reluctantly, reluctantly taking a bite. That Avery has withstood ten years of hawks, Beatrice chomps down on a big bite. It can hold one baby owl. After dinner, we all take Rufus out to his, his Avery. It's the one right next to Red's. She screeches at us, and Rufus's ear tufts go right up. He spreads his wings, hitting me in the face with his primary feathers, and raises all the feathers on his back, holding them up in a fantastic yet useless show of intimidating size. For extra measure, he begins clacking his beak. This is a bad sign, I say, spitting feathered fluff. We should take him back to the bird room. He and Red are just getting acquainted, Beatrice says. Red will show him who rules the roost, Dr. Cho nods towards Red Mews. Red's muse. That's what I'm afraid of, I whisper. Beatrice opens the door and I see that she's made the muse all cozy for Rufus. There are two big sticks nailed to the walls forming branches and a plywood perch up near the roof in the corner. There's a rock on the floor and a bowl of water. It looks okay, I say. Actually, it looks a lot better than okay and a lot nicer than our setup in the bird room. As if mirroring my thoughts, Rufus spreads his wings. I release the jesses and let him fly off my fist up to the plywood perch, which offers the highest vantage. He looks down at us disdainfully. Beatrice pulls a tidbit from a pouch and puts it on my fist. Whistle. I whistle. Rufus bobs his head, considers my fist. I whistle again. Rufus launches from the perch and flies straight to my fist and gobbles the tidbit. Dr. Cho and Beatrice exchange a knowing look. There must be waves of light coming off, off me from, my glow, from how glowy I feel. Rufus finishes his meal and sits on my fist. I flick my glove slightly and he rises into the air and flaps up to the plywood perch. He screeches, rouses, then blinks at us. I think he's found a home, Beatrice says and squeezes my shoulder. My eyes are watering again. He has, hasn't he? At least for tonight, if not forever. Good night, Rufus, I say. He squawks. I'll take that as a good night. Upstairs in my room, I take out the little box Jamie gave me. The arc reactor. Clicking on. Clicked on. It's a decent nightlight. I dig out my whittled hawk and put it in the, in the arc thingy on the windowsill near the bed. I drape mom's string of marabou, marabou around them. I never bothered decorating the room. I stayed in at Graham's. I lie back on my pillow, staring at the light and the hawk and the marabou fuzz, glowing like a furry halo around them. The deep black night began sparkles with stars. Sleep just comes, gentle as a hug.